This is the second lecture in the reproductive system covering the female. The ovaries are the female gonads. They are paired and form the secondary oocytes and hormones. The surface is covered with germinal epithelium, and below the germinal epithelium is the ovarian cortex made of connective tissue containing the ovarian follicles. The follicle includes the oocyte with surrounding cells to nourish the oocyte and secrete estrogen. The large fluid-filled follicle, which will expel the secondary oocyte, is referred to as a graphene follicle. After the follicle is expelled, the corpus luteum remains as a remnant of the ovulated follicle. The corpus luteum secretes progesterone, estrogen, relaxin, and inhibin until it degenerates. After it degenerates, it is called the corpus albicans. Extending out laterally from the uterus are the uterine or fallopian tubes, which will transport the oocyte from the ovary to the uterus. The infundibulum is the funnel-shaped end of the tube, which catches the opening. There are finger-like projections on the infundibulum to help draw the oocyte into the tube. The uterus provides a path for sperm to reach the uterine tubes and ovum, as well as a place for the fertilized ovum to implant and develop into a fetus. The interior body is the uterine cavity. The middle muscular layers are the myometrium and composed of smooth muscle for coordinated contraction. The inner layer is the endometrium and will nourish the sperm and zygote. The endometrium is the portion shed during the menstrual cycle. The space at the top of the vagina is the cervix. There may be mucous membranes here known as the hymen partially covering the vaginal opening, although this is generally lost as a result of physical activity before a female reaches puberty. The vaginal orifice is the opening to the canal. The vulva or pudendum is the term for the external female genitals. Above the pubic symphysis is an elevated area of adipose tissue called the mons pubis to cushion the pubic symphysis. The labia majora are the longitudinal folds of skin containing adipose tissue, which also have sebaceous and sudoriferous glands. The inner folds are the labia minora and contain sebaceous glands and a few sudoriferous glands. The clitoris is the nerve and erectile tissue for the female, which has a prepuce or layer of skin covering the body. The glands is the exposed portion of the clitoris, just as the male has the glands of the penis. The area between the labia minora is the vestibule. The external urethral orifice is the opening to the urethra. There are periurethral or Skene's glands located on either side of the vaginal orifice in the urethral wall to secrete mucus. The greater vestibular or Bartholin's glands also secrete mucus during arousal and intercourse, provide cervical mucus and lubrication. The mammary glands are for milk production. The nipple is where the milk duct emerges and is surrounded by a pigmented area called the areola. The suspensory ligaments of the breast or Cooper's ligaments help to support the breast tissue. The process of synthesizing and ejecting milk is lactation. The uterine or menstrual cycle is controlled by steroid hormones from the ovaries and causes changes in the endometrium. The process begins with gonadotropin releasing hormone and the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. FSH initiates the growth of the follicle and estrogen secretion, while LH further develops the follicle and leads to full secretion of estrogen. The estrogens develop and maintain the female reproductive structures develop the secondary sex characteristics, and promote protein synthesis, acting along with the IGFs, thyroid hormones, in lowering blood cholesterol. Many women notice changes in weight, metabolism, and energy throughout their cycle due to the interaction between the IGFs and the thyroid with estrogen. Progesterone is secreted mainly by the corpus luteum. This helps to prepare and maintain the endometrium for the ovum, which was released as well as the mammary glands. Relaxin is produced by the corpus luteum. 
During the monthly cycle, this will relax the uterus to help with implantation, and during pregnancy, increase flexibility of the joints, especially the pubic symphysis for delivery. Inhibit is secreted by the corpus luteum immediately after ovulation to inhibit the secretion of FSH and LH. This prevents more than one ovum from being released at a time, or at least most of the time. The first day of bleeding or shedding of the endometrium is considered day one of the menstrual cycle. The pre-ovulatory or follicular phase of the cycle occurs between the end of menstruation and ovulation at approximately day 6 to 13. FSH stimulates the growth of the follicle. As it matures and enlarges, many of the others die. With the increase of estrogen production under the influence of LH, the endometrium grows and ovulation occurs on day 14. The surge in LH and resulting surge in estrogen triggers the release of the ovum. The exact length of the cycle will vary female to female, and so will the time of ovulation. This chart allows you to see the corresponding temperature change that occurs with ovulation. This can be useful in helping to determine the optimum time to become pregnant, although it is less reliable as a form of birth control since sperm can continue to live at least 48 hours to 4 days in the female. The temperature does not increase until ovulation occurs, so intercourse two to three days prior could still have viable sperm. Many people are around today after this technique of birth control failed for their parents. The post-ovulatory phase or luteal phase occurs between ovulation to the onset of the menses. Here the corpus luteum secretes progesterone, estrogen, relaxin, and inhibin. If there is no fertilization, this will only last two weeks before the hormone secretion decreases and the hormone levels fall for a new cycle to begin. If fertilization does occur, HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, stimulates the secretion of hormones from the corpus luteum. This begins to come from the embryo at day eight and is what is measured in a pregnancy test. A positive pregnancy test is generally very reliable, but a negative test is not as reliable since the test may have occurred prior to day 8. The endometrium will grow until one week after ovulation. Just as a side note, there is no research showing that HCG provides weight loss in any way. Meiosis takes place during the formation of the oocytes or oogenesis. Meiosis I occurs during early fetal development. Most of these cells will degenerate before birth, but a few will survive and become primary oocytes. These will remain in this state until puberty. The secondary oocyte completes meiosis I to make a diploid cell and the first polar body. After meiosis I, the cell will divide again, but without replicating the genetic information. This will then produce a haploid cell along with another polar body. In meiosis II, at ovulation, a single secondary oocyte is released into the uterine tube. Each germ cell produces only one ovum and two polar bodies. The ovum is the mature egg, and the zygote is the united sperm and egg. We're going to watch a short clip that's going to show the uterine cycle and ovarian cycle. At sexual maturity, each of a woman's ovaries contains about 200,000 immature eggs called primary oocytes. A primary oocyte is diploid and is arrested in prophase one of meiosis. A layer of follicle cells surrounds each primary oocyte. Together, an oocyte and its follicle cells make up a follicle. An ovarian cycle lasts about 28 days, beginning at the first day of menstruation, or menses. During the first seven days of the cycle, six to twelve primary oocytes begin to mature. As the follicles develop, the follicle cells communicate with oocytes and pass them nutrients through pores called gap junctions. 
Each oocyte grows larger, and the surrounding follicle cells divide, proliferating to produce thousands of follicle cells in a single follicle. By day seven, all but one of the developing follicles begins to degenerate. The remaining follicle continues to develop, and its follicle cells continue to pump it with nourishment and also supply it with proteins and informational molecules needed for early stages of development. The maturing primary oocyte completes meiosis I and divides into two haploid cells. Each of these cells receives half the chromosomes. However, one cell, called a polar body, receives very little cytoplasm. The other, now a secondary oocyte, enters meiosis II and arrests there until fertilization. At day 14, ovulation occurs, and the secondary oocyte erupts from the ovary. The oviduct contains microscopic cilia that beat and draw in the released oocytes. This immature egg enters an oviduct, where it may become fertilized by a sperm cell and complete meiosis. The follicle cells that are left behind develop into a small mass of endocrine tissue called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum remains in the ovary for two weeks, secreting the hormones estrogen and progesterone. At the end of the ovarian cycle, if the woman is not pregnant, the corpus luteum disintegrates. Each month, the ovarian cycle is tightly coordinated with the uterine cycle. In the uterine cycle, the lining of the uterus builds up and then sloughs off. The cycle begins with the sloughing of the uterine lining. This is the first day of menses, also called menstruation. After menstruation, the uterine lining starts to grow again and to prepare for implantation of an embryo. During this phase of the uterine cycle, up until ovulation, the uterine lining proliferates. Capillary beds supply this tissue with nutrients. Just before menstruation occurs again, the capillary beds degenerate and no longer deliver the surrounding tissue with nutrients. During menstruation, this tissue dies and sloughs off through the vagina to the outside of the body. The ovarian cycle is controlled by the interplay of hormones from the pituitary gland and from the ovary itself. A few days before the beginning of the cycle, the anterior pituitary begins to increase its secretion of two hormones, follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. FSH and LH stimulate ovarian follicles to grow. As the follicles grow, they begin to secrete estrogen. During this phase of the cycle, the increasing levels of estrogen feed back on the pituitary to inhibit the release of additional FSH and LH. During the next week, the levels of FSH and LH drop. Beginning around day 12, the increasing levels of estrogen suddenly have the opposite effect on the pituitary gland. Instead of exerting a negative feedback on the pituitary, these hormones now exert a positive feedback, stimulating the pituitary to release FSH and large amounts of LH. LH reaches a peak at day 14 of the ovarian cycle. This LH surge triggers the mature follicle to rupture and release the egg, the process of ovulation. LH then triggers the remaining follicle cells to differentiate into the corpus luteum, which secretes estrogen and progesterone. The corpus luteum remains in the ovary, secreting estrogen and progesterone for the last two weeks of the cycle. At this point in the cycle, these hormones again inhibit the release of FSH and LH. A decline in FSH and LH restricts follicles from beginning to develop during the second half of the cycle. 
LH, or a hormone produced by an implanted embryo, is required to maintain the life of the corpus luteum. At the end of the cycle, if an embryo is not implanted, the corpus luteum degenerates. When the corpus luteum degenerates, it no longer releases estrogen and progesterone. The ovarian and uterine cycles are tightly coordinated. Hormones secreted by the ovary at different phases of the ovarian cycle trigger changes in the uterine lining. For example, at the beginning of the cycles, the levels of estrogen and progesterone are too low to maintain the uterine lining, and menses begins. About a week into the ovarian cycle, the developing follicle increases its secretion of estrogen, and estrogen levels in the body begin to rise. This hormone triggers the cells of the uterine lining to proliferate, and the lining becomes thicker. Just before ovulation, the level of estrogen in the body has reached its peak. Afterward, the follicle cells remaining in the ovary develop into the corpus luteum, a structure that releases estrogen and progesterone. The hormones maintain the uterine lining at a peak thickness and preparedness for embryo implantation. At the end of the cycle, if the egg is not fertilized or has not implanted, the corpus luteum breaks down and stops releasing estrogen and progesterone. Without these hormones, the uterine lining also breaks down, initiating menses. So you may also come back and view this link and take the quiz on your own.